This is something that's really important heading into this week. Going into this week, uh, I just want all of us to understand we're going into Easter week. And, uh, Easter is really a special time that's on the calendar for us every year. And the reason that I believe that is because I will personally testify, just like everybody else, it is so easy over the course of the year, over the course of a month or even a week, to let your mind and your heart be distracted by things that don't really even matter that much. The things that really matter the most, you almost have to put some space on your calendar and say, I'm going to discipline myself to focus on that. And I want you all to know something that I truly believe that if Jesus Christ really did leave, live and die on the cross for us, rise again from the grave and ascend back to the right hand of the Father in heaven, and it's one day going to come back for his people. If that's really true, which clearly I believe, then there is literally nothing more important on this planet. And with that in mind, I want to invite you this week to take extra time to get in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you can stop by outside and we'll make sure you get a Bible before you leave today. You can also go online and just download the Bible app. Uh, there's a new version of the Bible. You can do that. Spend some extra time doing some reading plans to draw closer to Jesus this week. If you're on our dream team, which is our volunteers around here, we call it. Dream Team. If you're on that, go on Slack every day this week and read. I'm going to be posting uh, a series of devotionals each day, beginning with today, to look and see what Jesus was doing that particular day of what we call Holy Week, which is the week leading up to Easter. We'll be doing a devotional every day. I'm not a great writer. I'm not uh, pretending to say anything original this week, everything I'm saying. I, I'm basically just saying things that have been being said for a couple thousand years. But what I'm trying to do is aim at the heart and say, let's focus in on Jesus this week. And if you're, you're visiting with us the first time this week, I want you to know next week is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be extremely powerful. We've got some testimonies and some music that are just going to, I, I don't know, we're going to be, we'll be throwing babies in here next week. I don't know. We're going to be so excited. It's going to be better than Super Bowl Sunday. We're throwing babies up. We'll catch them, by the way, when they come down. We're not throwing them down. We're not spiking babies in here. All right? Not a life point. They might in another church, but not here. We believe in healing, but we don't believe in tempting God. All right? We're going to, we're going to take care of the kids here. But I do want to say that next Sunday is going to be awesome. Please don't come alone. There's plenty of seats in here. We're about... Well, listen, there's plenty of seats in here. If you really believe that this is an important message, then I want to encourage you. Bring somebody with you. Because here's what I want you to know. They're going to hear about the love and the power of Jesus next week. They're going to hear about the life that Jesus came to offer. And I want you to know they're going to be reminded that Jesus overcame death and hell and the grave. And he can do amazing things in people's lives. Are you all good with that? Yes. So I want to encourage you on your way out. Take some of those invites that are out there. We've prepared them. We've put them in packs of like five or ten. Pick some of those up with you. Take them. Pass them out to coworkers, to friends. Bring someone with you next week. I don't want Life Point Hampton Roads and especially the gospel to be the best kept secret in Norfolk. I have no interest in in uh, us just having our own little holy huddle here. Can I just tell you, I have no interest in a holy huddle. I don't want to sit around and look at one another and say, you look so good. That's a nice suit. That's a nice dress. We got a photo booth coming next week. I'm not interested in the photo booth anywhere near as much as I am interested in what happens in this room. So please, consider who you can pray for and bring them with you to church next week so they can hear the gospel. Everybody good with that? Some of you are, and that's good enough to go on. So the, the series we've been in is called Why? And what we've been doing is we've been answering some of the most critical questions that people ask themselves in life. 
And we've been trying to look at it and be honest. Sometimes I've given answers. Last week in particular, I said we're going to address the problem. I'm not going to answer it to anybody's real satisfaction. And that question was why is there so much pain and suffering? We addressed it from a biblical standpoint. We addressed it personally, and we're honest about it from the Bible. But at the same time, I want you to know today we're going to ask a question, and then I'm going to answer it, and I'm going to give you a very biblical answer to it. And it's this question. Why did Jesus have to die? Have you ever asked that question? I mean, why did Jesus really have to die? I mean, if he's, a, if he's a good God and a forgiving God, couldn't he, just, couldn't he just have forgiven people? Couldn't he just forgive everyone and just, I mean, all this stuff about the cross? I mean, could, could God not just chill out on that whole justice stuff? Why did Jesus have to die? Well, there's an answer for that, and it's an answer that I think we all demand from our judges in the world today. Especially if if a court case is going to ultimately uh, be taking care of someone or something that we really care about. We want to know that there's ultimately going to be justice if we've been offended. We know God is many things. He is creator. We know that he is savior. We also need to know that he is the one who will ultimately judge. And if he is judged, then the question is, can we trust him to do what is right? If he doesn't do what is just. And the answer is no. If there is no justice, then why can we trust God at all? You want justice. I want justice. As a matter of fact, some of you are so determined to get justice that if something happens to someone in your family, you'll go get justice whether anybody else does or not. You you won't even wait for the police. You won't wait for a mediator. You're going to exact justice in the situation. You're going to demand it. We've all heard of uh, corrupt judges, have we not? We've heard of judges who have predetermined a decision on a trial before the trial is ever brought to them and before the evidence is even presented. They've already determined which way they're going to go based on who's bringing the evidence to them. They're going for that one or they're going for that one based on their predetermined ideas. Does anybody really respect that kind of a judge? No. So we ask the question, why did Jesus really have to suffer? The answer is, is because if Jesus did not suffer, how can we trust God to do what is right in a fallen world? There's a passage in Romans chapter 3 that really addresses this. And here it is. Verse 21. The Apostle Paul says this, but now apart from the law. The righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, just to pause right there for one second, because I'm jumping in in context to a larger passage of Scripture. This righteousness of God is referring to how can somebody actually be right in their standing before God? Like, how can somebody, like, approach God? How do you know that you're okay with God, that God's forgiven you? How can you know that you have any sort of peace and relationship really with God? How can you know that? How can we experience that? And that's what Paul is addressing. He's he's saying, well, that righteousness has now been made known And it's been made known apart from the law. And he says in verse 22, the righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And he says there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, you could also say patience, in His long-suffering ways, in His patience, in that He had left the sins committed beforehand, meaning before Jesus, unpunished. But He did all of this when it says that He did it. He means He did all of this to demonstrate His righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Zone in with me for just a minute on verse 26. Leave that up there if you would on the screen. This way, this righteousness is given to people by faith in Jesus apart from the law. He did it this way so as to be just and the one who justifies sinners who have now placed their faith in Jesus. So in order for God to be just and to justify sinners, there had to be something that made that possible. For God to be just and forgiving is really the question or the answer to the question of why did Jesus have to die? Because God is just. And He always will be just. He always will be perfect. He always will do the right thing. He always will. But He is also forgiving. And willing to forgive those who place their faith in Jesus. He is both simultaneously. And so with that being said... Why did Jesus have to die? There were three reasons. Reason number one is this. Jesus had to die to pay a penalty. Reason number two, Jesus had to die to fulfill prophecy. And then reason number three, Jesus had to die to communicate with clarity. Now let's jump in. Are you ready? Reason number one. If you're ready, say amen. amen. All right. Jesus died on the cross the way that he did because he was paying a penalty. You see, by the sacrifice of his own blood, Jesus made a way for people to be made right with God. By the sacrifice of his own blood, Jesus made a way for people to be made right with God. Now, I drew your attention there just a minute ago to Romans chapter 3, verse 26, and I just... I want you to get that like a, a, like a bulldog. I, I want you to not let this go in your mind. He is, verse 26 said, he is just and he is the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He is just and yet he still forgives those who have faith in Jesus. Well, that's, you know, that's easy to say, but let's think about that for just a minute. You see, when you think about what is being said here, he's talking about God forgiving sinful, broken, fallen people. Who is he talking about? Well, we know from the passage of Scripture, if you look at Romans chapter 1 through Romans chapter 3, that affects all of humanity, beginning with Adam. We talked about Adam and Eve in here a couple of weeks ago. And what we know about Adam is that they, they uh, basically, they rebelled against God. They had a perfect world. God said, there's only one tree in the garden I don't want you to eat from. But if you do eat from it, you're going to die. And what did they do? They ate from the tree. They ate from the tree. And while the physical death on them took a while, the reality is there was death in that moment. There was death to innocence. There was death to peace. Death between peace and them uh, before the Lord. Death, death between, with peace between one of them. Uh, one another, if I can speak. Uh, there's, there's death between their peace with all the created things on the earth. I mean, that was a cool world they were living in. They're naming animals. They're taking care of plants. They're walking around with God. They're fellowshipping with God. It's a great world that they're living in. 
But in the moment that they did that, all of a sudden, all that peace was gone. And you know, uh, if, if you read the story, you know this. You know that after they did what they did, they hid. They tried to hide from God. How many of you know that's pretty foolish? You cannot hide from God. And they found that out very quickly. Not only did they hide from God, but all of a sudden, they are aware of their nakedness. Before that, everything was just great. Now there's shame. There's embarrassment. There's total lack of peace. And they cover themselves. They cover themselves with fig leaves. Do you know what God did when he came? He talked to them. He spoke to them. He told them about the consequences for what they had just done. And you know what else he did? He took the fig leaves from them. There was an animal sacrifice, the first one, and he took live animal skin and covered them. It's the first instance of blood being required to cover someone's shame. It's just the first one. It's going to happen many times over in the scriptures. And I've thought through how can I do this and do this fast. And an East Tennessee hillbilly boy cannot do it fast. So I'm just going to throw a couple out there at you and just encourage you to go look at these on your own. But here's what I want you to, to do. I want you to know God called a guy named Abraham. His name was Abram. And he, and he tells him, hey, I'm going to make you a great nation. And you're going to come and follow me. Leave your family, you and your wife alone. We're going to go on this journey together. I'm going to make you a blessing to the entire world. You're going to be, you're going to be the father of nations. And it went, I mean, over 25 years that that never happened. Finally, God has uh, this wonderful answer to Abraham and Sarah's prayer and gives him Isaac. Isaac grows up, and when Isaac grows up, God comes to Abraham and he says to him, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to take him up over on this mountain over here, Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him for me. Wow. This is his only boy. Now he's had another son, but this is the son of promise. This is the one with Sarah. And he takes his son, and, and in faith, he takes the boy up there. How many of you would have just been beside yourself in this moment? I, I get so uncomfortable anytime I really read this thoughtfully and prayerfully. But Abram did it. He told Isaac, put this stuff to build the altar on your back. We're going up there. We're going to build an altar. Then we're going to do a sacrifice. Isaac lays across the altar. By the way, Isaac is a teenager at this point. Abraham is an old man. I have wondered many times, Isaac probably could have beaten his dad up. This is not just something that's happening to one. It's happening to both. Isaac is on the altar. Abraham raises his knife to come down and to come bring the sacrifice down. And there's a voice that comes and says, don't do it. Don't do it. He says, look over in the thicket. And, and over in the thicket is a ram. And over there is that sacrifice that God provided. He says, offer oh, that sacrifice. He says, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I will provide. I will provide. I tell you, when I read that through there, and I think, good Lord, I have one child. She's grown now. I can't hardly stand to see her in pain. To think about laying her on the altar and doing that. And by the way, God knew what he was doing. This was a test of faith. Abraham did not have to go through the sacrifice. And just in case you're wondering, if you're not a believer, I need to be clear with this. God never told any of his kids to sacrifice another human being. This was not something God sanctioned, God ordered. This was a test of faith. Ultimately, what is being pictured here is what God is going to do with his son Jesus on the cross. And by the way, what we call Mount Calvary later in the New Testament, many people say is Mount Moriah in the Old. Same mountain. But in that moment, there was nobody to stop God from bringing judgment on his son Jesus. 
Let me fast forward to another one where there's a blood sacrifice. There's a blood sacrifice over there in Leviticus chapter 16. God is setting up an established system where he, he sets up the, this idea. How many of you have ever heard of a scapegoat? Raise your hand if you've heard of a scapegoat. Have you, how many of you ever had younger siblings or older siblings and they became a scapegoat when you got busted? You tried, to, you tried to blame them for it, right? Well, I want you to understand something. That phrase, scapegoat, came from the Bible. Because there were two sacrifices that had to be made. One was a blood sacrifice that the high priest would go in and present once a year on behalf of all the people of Israel. And then the other one was one where the, the high priest would come out and lay his hands on the head of the second lamb. And he would do this and he would confess the sins for all the people for all of last year. And they would take that lamb out and there would be an assistant who would take that lamb away from the people. What has happened in this moment? It's on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You have blood taken into the Holy of Holies, which is the place of worship. It's the most holy pla place for all of Israel. The blood was taken in there. God accepted that sacrifice. And then those, those sins were laid symbolically on that other lamb. And those sins were taken away outside the camp. And that lamb was walked away until nobody there could see that lamb anymore. Blood was a sacrifice required. Why was that? The reason for that is because the crime has, excuse me, the punishment has to fit the crime. And the punishment has to fit the crime for humanity in the sense of we have committed cosmic treason, as one theologian calls it. You see, when you and I attempt to supplant God as king of the universe, king of our lives, as the one who governs over all, when we say, I want my way, not your way, when we do that individually, and when we did that as a species, I want you to understand it's cosmic treason. And in order for treason to be punishment, the punishment is death. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, in case you're wondering, well, I don't think I'm that bad. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, there's no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned. That means you, and that definitely means me. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, it says this, the wages for sin is death. I want you to understand, the reason for the blood was because the punishment has to fit the crime. And make no mistake about it, you and I, as it relates to God, have sinned. And therefore, our sin is an affront to God. And it has to be punished. Otherwise, listen, God is not just. How many of you think, no, don't raise your hand. I'm not that bad. I saw a guy do this in a video one time. It was so cringeworthy. Anybody watch YouTube every now and then just like watch stupid videos? <laughs> guy goes up to another guy and he's like, um, would you consider yourself a sinner? And he's like, I'm better than most people. He's like, well, well what do you mean by sin? He's like, well, let me ask you this. Uh, have you ever lied before? He's like, well, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I guess I have before. I don't tell a lot of big lies, you know, little white lies. He says, really, how many times does somebody have to lie to be a liar? Is it like 100? Is it 150? All once. When you were a kid, did you ever uh, disobey your parents? Well, not too bad. I mean, you know. Did you ever disobey your parents? All right. There's a couple of commandments broken. Let me ask you this. Have you ever stolen anything? Taken anything that's not true? I don't steal. I'm not a thief. That's something I've never done. Really. Have you never been to a bank or to some place that has pins out there and taken one of those pins? I just want you to know. Life on Church Hampton Roads gives away pins. So there are no thieves without pins, all right? Hallelujah. You, you, have you ever done something where you've taken something that wasn't yours? 
the neighbor's apples that fell from the tree? How many times does a person have to steal to be a thief? How many times do you lie to have to be a liar? How many times do, how many times do you have? Listen, there are a lot more sins. Here's the one that just wraps it up. How many days in your life have you lived where you did not love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind? How many days? And that is a command. I can stop right now, couldn't I, and just say, oh, Lord. There was a, a young lady named Grace. We were on a missionary trip to China. And in this missionary trip to China, uh, Grace... We met her because she was brought to Philadelphia to attend school because her dad was a higher up uh, person ranked in the government in China. And uh, I'm not going to say what his ranking was, but I will say this. He was, he was high up there. We met uh, Grace and, and uh, we found out she got in a little bit of hot water when she told her parents that she had become a Christian. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that I realize that I am a sinner in need of God's grace. Do you know that sin, the way they translate it in, uh, in her language in Chinese, I don't remember which dialect it was, but whatever dialect it was, do you know that that word meant criminal? She said, because, so when she told her dad, she's now a Christian. Why? Because I became a criminal. I realized I was a criminal. And I'm just going to tell you the way they looked at that was not the way we look at this. It was pretty extreme. But here's what I want you to know. I wonder if their reaction is more appropriate than my reaction. Extreme. I don't, listen, we're going to get the good news. But here's what I want you to know. You and I don't need to take it lightly that Jesus paid the price for our sin. See, there was a penalty that needed to be paid. Because God couldn't wink at sin. He couldn't wink at it. He couldn't say no problem. But I want you to know the good news is this. With the problem, he provided the solution. See, he's just. Every sin ever committed, every sin has been placed on Jesus. You and I now have this opportunity to believe that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin. And it is through faith in Jesus, it is through receiving Jesus, that you and I can be forgiven. I want you to know that every time you drive past a steeple where there's a cross, it's God. Every time you look at a necklace where there's a cross, it's God. Every time you go past the cemetery and you see little crosses, it's God reminding you, screaming at you, consider the cross. What is going on here? What is going on here is that God has sent His only Son to pay the penalty for sinful, fallen, rebellious people like you and like me. God said, I am going to do this. I am going to make a way where the penalty is taken care of. You see, God can be just because God still demanded that the penalty be paid. But God said, none of them can actually pay the price. They couldn't afford it in any way. It requires perfect blood. It requires holy blood. It requires a holy life. It requires a life that, that has lived up to the law. And guess what? That's why Jesus came. Are you all with me? This means so much to me, and here's why. I think it's important that you and I understand that Jesus paid a penalty for you and for me. Jesus didn't just die randomly for the universe. Jesus was not just a good moral teacher. He was not providing an example on the cross. He was providing a sacrifice. 
And I want you all to understand this right now, and I want you to understand this. He did it for you, and he did it for me. I, I, I want to move on, but I wanted you to know the wages for sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God is just by laying his, his, uh, his wrath on Jesus because he could afford it. He could bear it. He could put that on his shoulders and he could carry it. None of us could. But Jesus could. Come on. And he did. Jesus paid that penalty. The second reason Jesus died was to fulfill prophecy. I could take you through so many passages of Scripture. I only want to read one. We're going to read Isaiah 53. And I want you to listen as I read this. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. But he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he didn't open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, Jesus was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? In other words, by the way, who was at the cross saying, No, don't do that. Don't do that. Stop. Stop. Nobody. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Listen to this. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. I want you all to know this. That passage that I just read to you, which is so descriptive of what happened to Jesus, was written uh, almost 600 years before Jesus was born. It's like it's written after the fact. It was written before it ever happened. Psalm 22 is a passage I'm not going to read to you, but I'm going to say this. It is written from the perspective of a human being hanging on a cross, and it begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's King David a thousand years before Jesus was born. A thousand years before he's born, he's writing as one being crucified, and he's talking about things that happen explicitly at the foot of the cross. They're, they're playing games for his garments. He talks about the thirst that he's experiencing. He talks about his heart melting like wax. He talks about all this stuff. His bones are not broken. He does all these things, and this is a thousand years before Jesus was born. And listen to this. This is astounding. This was 400 years before crucifixion was even a thing. There was no crucifixion, and David is writing a song like he's looking down from the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, listen to me. Listen and hear what the word of the Lord is saying to us. There's no mistake where you go to find forgiveness. There's no mistaking who your Savior is. There's no mistaking who the Messiah is. He is Jesus that came on the cross between the heaven and earth. That man that has nailed between his ears and his feet, a crown of thorns on his head. There's no mistaking. That is the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill the prophecy. So that we were looking for the place to go to find peace with God and forgiveness, we would say it's right there. Yeah. It's not in Rome. There is no Pope that can give forgiveness. It's not in Mecca. You can make all the Hajjas you want. There's no forgiveness in Mecca. 
There's no forgiveness in your sin. You can talk about forgiveness all day long, but please hear me. Forgiving yourself, it's a good idea, but ultimately, you forgiving yourself has no value. If you don't have forgiveness from God, the only one who can truly forgive you for all the things that you have done wrong, for every lie, for every bad word you ever said. I just want you to know there is nowhere else you can go except to the cross of power. It's the blood of Jesus, and He's only the blood of Jesus. That's it. And it's all that matters. It's all that matters. People are looking to pills. They're looking to alcohol. They're looking to sex. They're looking at Bitcoin. They're looking everywhere, hoping to find something that can lift the load. I want you to know the only place you can go is to the cross of Calvary. There is nowhere else you can go except in Jesus. The high and exalted. got me when I gave my life to Jesus was I was like, I can never do this. I, can, I can't be a Christian. I, I don't even want to list the things. Like, I can't quit all that. The pastor made it very clear. The gospel of Jesus Christ isn't about what you do. Your faith isn't in you. The object of your faith is not your faith. The object of your faith is not your church. The object of your faith is Jesus. And that's what the gospel tells us. That's what the cross tells us. It's about Jesus. It doesn't make me want to go out and abuse grace. It makes me want to love him more. It makes me want to soak in his grace more. It makes me want to sit at his feet more when I actually think about it. He's forgiven me. He's willing to forgive anybody in here. I just want you to know you don't have to live in shame. You don't. Your sins can be forgiven today. You don't have to live with uncertainty. God can give you peace today. 
You don't have to live wondering what's going to happen when I die. Today, you can come to Jesus in faith. And just like a flood, peace will come into your soul. Now, there'll be other things that will fight that peace later. I assure you of that. But today, you can have peace with God if you'll call out the faith. Call out by faith in the finished work of Jesus. All of us are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we're going to take a time right now where we're going to worship. We're going to do a few things uh, for Christians that are here. We're just going to give you all a time to refresh and kind of renew your faith. Because we all need that sometimes. We all need revival sometimes. No Christian is perfect. By the way, if you're visiting for the first time today uh, and you really want a perfect church, this isn't it. If you haven't figured that out already, this is not it. Because I'm here. And you're here. It's not perfect. Because there's none perfect. There's only one. And that's Jesus. We point you to Him. Here's, here's where, what I want to invite every Christian to do. Christians, you need the gospel. Ask God to renew your faith and to reignite your fire. I want to be a part of a church with people on fire for Jesus. Love for Jesus. Don't you? Wouldn't that be great? One of the things that I'll do is we'll open the altar. You can come and pray. We're going to sing a song in just a second. We're going to come, we're going to open the altar, you can come and pray. The other thing we're going to do is you're going to, they're going to, there will be two ushers up here, and we're going to take communion. Uh, they're going to have the elements in the little basket when they come up, and I want to invite everyone to take communion who has their faith in Jesus. We do this so that we remember it's not about us, it's about Him.